In this series, we are taking diversity in scuba head on. Our purpose is to raise our collective consciousness and be a part of a continuing evolution of this sport we are all so passionate about. We recognize that this topic may be controversial for some. We hope you'll stick around and learn with us from this journey of stepping into other people's shoes. These conversations are important to have out loud so we can grow together. Be sure to subscribe to get the latest episode and join the conversation in our Facebook group. And that's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the dive table. All right. Well, I am super excited about the conversation that we're going to have today. And of course, uh, Sarah and I have been working hard on this series and excited to have you with us, Ara, all the way from the Philippines. I think it's 1 a.m. your time. And so yeah. how, how are you doing? Are you awake? Are you ready for this? How do you feel? I, I've been ready. I've been a bit anxious, but ready. <laughs> we're so happy to have you. I, so I reached happy. out. Oh, sorry. Um, I reached out to you because I've been following you on Instagram for a long time. And I just absolutely love the content that you produce. Like you're so good at it. You're such a delight to watch on your stories and everything. I think you're so funny. And um, I've been really excited to see you get into guiding trips like that's it's such a, a cool thing and I think you're probably killing it I mean I, I can't wait to hear more about it but I, it would be great to get a little background on you and your experience okay well thank you for having me I'm very honored that I got invited to your show so a little bit about me I'm a digital content creator based in the Philippines so I do a lot of content around Philippines and diving in the Philippines. And of course, my personal experiences as a diver. So um, originally, I just wanted to do a website about scuba diving and to promote scuba diving. But like through the years, it has evolved and my um, Instagram or social media accounts have grown. And I've built a community around it. And I actively promote local diving. And right now, I'm slowly transitioning into organizing trips in my home country because I feel like um, a lot of people have been showing interest in visiting and diving with me. So I was like, okay, might as well try it and see how it goes. Awesome. Amazing. And can I ask your pronouns for this interview just so that we all can communicate appropriately? She and her. <laughs> Awesome. I'm she, her as well. I'm Sarah. I haven't introduced myself, but, um, and then we have Jay with he and he, him. him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for giving us some background. Um, so in this conversation, we're going to be talking about race and I will say just so people know, I'm sure they already do, but I am a token white girl here in the conversation. <laughs> so I'm excited to hear from you guys. Uh, my background, like my uh, family background, is Irish and Scottish. So can't get <laughs> wider than that. Um, <laughs> but uh, Jay, you want to share your background? Yeah. So it's I have a very interesting background because uh, I haven't shared this publicly, I don't think, in, in any forum. Um, but uh, I'm Filipino. Uh, so the the cat is out of the bag. <laughs> we got right, a Filipino, yeah. Um, but but I was my father, uh, who it all come, well, my Filipino side comes from my grandmother, right? And and that line of of heritage for me. Um, so my father left when I was very young, uh, one or two, and he with him took all of that. Kind of cultural um, knowledge and and being raised in the idea of of being Filipino. My mom, on the other hand, is kind of like you, Sarah. You know, very I think uh, UK and Irish um, and a little bit of American Indian, and so you yeah. know, white, white, eh, minus the American Indian. 
And so I was raised in a very predominantly, I would say, culturally white way, right? I, I actually had no view of myself other than that, right? I, I had no view of myself as a Filipino or as a person of color growing up. Um, and talking to my mom about it, and mom, I love you, uh, but, you know, let's talk about this. Later in life, much later in life, you know, she, she would use phrases like, you know, I was worried about you being a mixed race. And I was worried about how you might get treated. And mm. so she very much so insulated me from my my cultural identity of being Filipino. And of course, I was raised very white. You know, I had a few Filipino friends, but, you know, it reminds me of South Park and, and the character Token. You know, that, that's kind of how I felt, you know, but I never identified as anything but white. Years later, um, and, and again, I, I, uh, I won't mention names here, but I had an experience where uh, we were, my wife was pregnant with our first child. Um, things were a little hairy in the moment um, with, with the, the child um, caring and, and potential birth and all that. And so I call it Dr. Doom and I laugh about it now, but at the time it wasn't funny at all. But it was kind of Dr. Doom came into the room and told us all of the millions of things that could go wrong and, and, and graphic detail. And it was, it was pretty horrific. And after that, a nurse came into the room and said, hey, well, um, we need to, you to sign some paperwork that you've been informed of all this and get some information on, uh, you know, from you. And so it's the typical medical information, you know, your name, your age, your date, you know, date of birth, blah, blah, blah. And they get to the question of ethnicity. And of course, my wife says she is white and no one in the room flinches an eye. They get to me and I say, you know, my name, my age, my, my birth, and they get to ethnicity. And I also say white. Because that's how I saw myself at the time. And this is later in life. Yeah. And everyone in the room, which are close family members to me, um, does this does this like <laughs> whatever whatever <laughs> sound you want to make, right? Just like choking on, you know, like almost laughing, like what? Like, no, you're not. Oh no. And, and it hit me in that moment. And as I processed that moment, holy crap, they don't see me as white. I do, but they don't see me that way. Mm -hmm. And that led me on this journey of like, holy crap, all of these instances in my life, that has been true. I just mm -hmm. wasn't aware of it. And so that's kind of been my history. And now as a father, you know, with, with reconciling these things, you know, how do I, it's, I'm not connected to that culturally, right? How do I foster that? Kid? So I've talked a lot. It's a very complicated thing when it comes yeah. to me and, and race and, identity and, and culture and all these things and, and where I fit feels like I don't fit anywhere. But that journey for the last you know, 10 plus years of reconciling my Filipino heritage with my white upbringing has been a, a really interesting one that's had lots of ups and downs and, and lots of instances where, you know, emotionally you feel one way or the other way. Uh, but I, I'm glad I'm sharing this publicly finally because I don't think anyone's ever really heard this. And, and that's uh, not, not to steal the show from you, Ara, but that, that was my – I wanted to make sure that came out so that we have a very clear conversation mm -hmm. uh, in, in when it comes to race and scuba diving in general. Wow. Like, that's kind of <laughs> wild. No, it's it yeah. really is because, like, we know that the sport, like, the reason why we're talking about this is that the sport is very much, like – old white man right like all of us can nod and say like that's who we typically see on dive boats so i would love to hear um from from both of you um your experience about just being in this world and like how how has that affected you have you noticed a difference of you being treated differently that kind of stuff okay um, I just want to say with Jay's experience, mine was kind of reverse in the sense that when you, you sent me like some questions earlier and then you said person of color and I was like, wait a minute, I'm a person of color and it didn't dawn on me until you told me because I guess I'm mm. always surrounded with other people of color. So to me, I'm like ordinary. I'm not like standing out from everyone else, if you know what I mean. So it's like reverse of what jay is experiencing or it has mm -hmm. experience we're in i don't see myself as person of color because i'm in the philippines so 
I don't see it as much. Yeah. Uh, does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. It's it's more of like a, a global majority, yeah. right? This is that was a very um like um, United States centric sort of uh, uh perspective. <laughs> yeah. 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 But you are, you probably do deal with a lot of, of tourism when it yeah, comes definitely. to diving. And I would imagine the majority of that yeah. Yeah. would, would see you in a certain way versus exactly. they see themselves. Right. Yep. What, what experiences have you had in, in that way, I guess, in, in dealing more with those that, that are coming to dive with you or coming to the Philippines to experience that not from there? Well, surprisingly, my interactions with foreigners have been really good or positive. Like <clears throat> I've, I haven't had any um, like alarming or negative um, interactions wherein I felt really discriminated because of, I'm Filipino. That is coming from um, like foreigners who are vis visiting here. What I get discrimination from, surprisingly, are from fellow Filipinos. Hmm. <clears throat> I know that sounds strange, but like there's a certain stigma or like um, stereotype that when I'm traveling within the Philippines, they kind of judge me or like treat me differently because I'm Filipino. <laughs> and it's because a lot of the dive shops get a lot of foreigners and not a wow. lot of Filipinos. So that's where the discrimination comes in, in my opinion, or like in my experience. So, for instance, I'd be taking a group or like a friend. I'd, I'd, I'd invite a friend over to the Philippines and, hey, let go, di go diving with me. And as soon as I step in a dive shop, they'll assume that they're the diver and not me. Mm. So that's where the discrimination comes in because they already have like a, in their head, they're thinking, oh, foreigner, that's the diver. And it's never like, I'm like just a friend taking the diver and I'm not the diver. So... Right. That's where the discrimination comes in. It's when fellow Filipinos think that maybe I'm just the girlfriend of that person and I'm just, you know, you know what I mean? That, totally. That yeah. stereotype. That's what I've experienced when I'm diving with other foreigners. That's fascinating. That's so and, fascinating and, because... And, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I don't go know ahead. You. And, and I think it's because... It, it's also a reflection of what they're seeing or what they they experience. Like all the people who go diving are foreigners. And it's mm -hmm. rare or like in a lot of play, of these places when they have um, guests it's gonna or divers, majority of their guests will be foreigners. And it's rare to get the locals or it's going to be like a handful of people who, who are locals who will be diving in that destination. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw that a, a lot in Indonesia as well when mm -hmm. I had my business there. Yeah. I, it was much more common to see people travel from Europe to dive in Komodo versus getting people from Jakarta, right? Yeah. And part of it was, you know, our, our market, the, the three of us owners, were we were all white. We spoke <laughs> English and Spanish. You know, we had Indonesian um staff but uh you know on on a very functional level we could not serve them properly because we didn't have local instructors that was always our goal to get local instructors but we just weren't open long enough to train people to get to that point um so that's really interesting that you that you say that when traveling in your own country yeah and it's ha happened a few times actually so it's like and and I know other people, like other local divers who've had the same experience wherein they were treated as if they're not divers because the assumption is that the foreigners are the divers and you're just like local visitor or local tourist. Like yeah. I was talking to a friend a, uh, a few weeks ago and he said, yeah, I was in Puerto Galera, one of the like, popular dive destinations. And he was just sitting around and the waitress or one of the servers in the restaurant, I guess it was like a dive shop with a restaurant or like a resort, was actually like hinting to him that it was a diverse resort and he shouldn't even be staying there or like sitting there or having mm. a meal there. And he was so shocked because he said, 
I can't believe I'm being discriminated in my own country <laughs> because of the way the other Filipinos were treating him. Right. That's, no, that's wild. fascinating. Well, it's, it's interesting because in, in a way you're describing what I would kind of think about as, as this stereotype that's reinforced from the other end. Right. Yeah. Because it is true. I mean, you, you know, if you look at the statistics of, dive travelers as far as what's been published mm-hmm. you know most of them are you know earn above a hundred thousand dollars a year <laughs> you know they're mostly college graduates they're all homeowners for the most part they're mostly male and they're mostly white so mm-hmm. that's the the profile that of of a dive traveler and it's interesting that that gets cemented and like you said sarah and, and ara you know Diving happens across the world. I mean, Southeast Asia is a hotbed for scuba diving, mm-hmm. for sure. From Malaysia to Indonesia to the Philippines, uh, I mean, Thailand, all over. And yet that stereotype is so embedded. It's kind of a, a, a systematic view of a diver equals a white <laughs> male, not a beautiful Filipino woman. Right. Or not a Filipino male or not, uh, you know, because that's yeah. not diving. But I find that fascinating. Right. Because the, the, the inverse of that is when you have someone like me who doesn't fit that profile living in the States, you know, how is that systemic racism here? Right. If I don't fit that, that, that profile or I wonder what would happen if I came to the Philippines, how they would see me. You know, I, I don't know. Right. Uh, so it's very, very interesting that you share that. I really appreciate you sharing. Okay, going going back to what you just talked about with like the the numbers, the stats. Yeah. I I think it comes back to I, uh, you know, even from the the very beginning of getting trained, mm-hmm. you look at training materials, and all you see are are white guys, and like now there's women too, but it's still just very white. Right. Like, I, I can't believe it. And I can't even imagine being someone who like, you look at these materials and like marketing online. I mean, marketing online has gotten a little bit better. They're like, organizations are trying a little bit. Um, But like the training materials are terrible. And if you looked at that, not being white, like, I, I can't even, you know, like that, that has to feel a certain way. And I hope that the organizations will pick up and make change, you know, like, is that something that you guys have seen or felt? Yeah, definitely. I was going to say like the marketing materials, the way they promote diving as a sport or an activity, it's always the same look or the same profile. I mean, I appreciate that they try to have like ambassador divers and like try to incorporate that, but, I feel like they haven't really maximized that way of marketing the sport as a, you know, like anybody can do it. It's still the same mm-hmm. material, the same content that's being churned out on the internet. And that's what people are seeing. Like the internet is such a powerful tool to promote the sport. And yet it's always going to be the same faces or the same race that's promoting it. Yeah. It's, um, and it doesn't, I don't know, it, it seems like in this day and age, 2024, it's like, and especially because a lot of these organizations do have the marketing budget. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's available, you know? Yeah. And so when I see uh, marketing, like I've just recently seen some, uh, I've seen some marketing uh, efforts and I'm like, really? Again? Like, how how have we not decided to choose other people for yeah. this, you know? I don't know. Yeah, I, I uh, it's so interesting because, again, through my eyes, I, I don't, I'm still reconciling this, right, for, for myself. And, yeah. and so if I see a white person as an advertisement, I may, I probably see myself in them and I, and that's partially true. And I also think oftentimes, you know, this, this is not just unique to scuba diving, 
right? It's, it's, uh, you know, a lot of recreational sports, uh, golf, uh, skiing, wakeboarding, um, the one that I hate the most, which is, you know, skiing or, uh, well, no snowboarding. There it is. The one that I killed my knees on, uh, Ew. you know, all of it kind of has that same vibe, um, adventure sports in general. And, and again, I think the, the, on one end, advertising can be reflective of the statistics, right? That that's a marketer's job in some ways is to try and match what's happening out in the real world so that people can see themselves as the hero in that ad. On the other end, marketing, as we well know, in a lot of ways can be a cultural lead um, and not just marketing, but in, in how it's reflected in the materials. And that's the part that I find very fascinating is, you know, um, a lot of the, the global agencies, um, the big box agencies, very much so tout the idea of how many countries they're involved in something like, you know, the latest I saw was 186 plus countries and territories we have a, a dive shop in. And so there, these global agencies are global in that sense. And the dive shop owners in a lot of these cases, the, the question I have is the dive shop owners and the operators within there, the, the instructors, the, the dive masters, you know, the, the service technicians, sales reps, are, are those local people or is that more working tourism? People coming from the States, white or, or wherever, white male traveling and becoming, you know, the Indonesian dive shop owner. And so I would imagine, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> Not a, a stick, shot. Man. That was a kill shot. Don't worry. We have, we have episodes on, on gender uh, coming up. I'm sure I'm going to step into some things. But uh, no, it's true. My point being, yeah. my point being is, is when you talk about the marketing and you talk about materials and you talk about representation in those areas, if you can't simply say we're just reflecting the the statistics that are true of the community of divers because that neglects the idea that you're in 186 countries and territories yeah. that you have to be reflective of your own organization exactly and so in that way i think absolutely there there is a moment i don't think for the token person of color to be included but more for agencies, including my own agency, but agencies and the industry in general to be more of a reflective mirror to what the diving community actually is out in the world. And I would say that that diving community is diverse. I would say that there are people like Ara around the world who are awesome divers, part of the industry, influencers in such an incredible way with diver bliss are but are not yet reflected back in the very organizations that they choose to be a part of and so i think that's the miss and i think that that's the the thing that at least i see when when you ask the question sarah about materials and marketing and is that it's not accurate or reflective of what's actually happening it's more i would say entrenching an existing or, or a past belief, kind of what we've talked a lot about Sarah too, is how, how entrenched the diving industry is in, in the past, uh, not in what is today and what could be in the future. Um, but yeah, that's my two cents. I'm probably going to take a lot of hate meal for that one. <laughs> oh, um, so he's... He's popped out. It's okay. He he bumped his microphone again. Oh, okay. Um, but uh... <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> He's got to stop moving around when he talks. <laughs> um. Oh you man. Hate meal. Oh, I I don't think so. It's okay. yeah. Um. Yeah, I I don't think we're getting to. Uh, scandalous with this it's yeah. it's a pretty common um feeling are you back i'm back okay sorry 
Um, it's <laughs> like a force I know, field right here. Yeah, you really need to. Um, I need to fix that. Sorry. Yeah. Well, since so we're, since we're talking about it. marketing, I think at the end of the day, it's also because of the money factor. I think yes. it goes boils down to that. Like yeah. they're gonna market to a predominantly white market because they have the money. They're the ones who can afford the diving. And I think that's where the inequality comes mm-hmm. in. Um, like I'm a third world income earner and I can't afford a lot of these courses, right. a lot of these diving because I'm earning from a third world country. So income wise, there's going to be a huge discrepancy. And yet I'm, I'm paying for the same price or same rates as let's say getting certified or, you know, getting a, a open water course the booklets or the courses online is going to be priced the same regardless of where you get it, right? Mm. And I think that's kind of unfair for people. So that in itself kind of gatekeeps diving for a lot of nations, a lot of individuals, because in the first place, they can't afford it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very true. And especially in places like the Philippines, um, Indonesia, it's, it's very much priced in a way that keeps locals out that's that's one of the things that you know I, I did get a kill shot from Jay earlier but like it was one of our goals as a dive shop especially understanding that we were coming in as foreigners that uh, we wanted to have local dive masters and local instructors and that was one of the things that was we didn't get to to finish it but it comes with a, a good ending um one of our office guys, the he would help us with um, preparing the boat and like moving equipment around, you know, riding mm-hmm. the scooters around town, making sure all of the stuff was prepped. Uh, we got him through his open water course and his advanced. Yeah. And then it the pandemic hit and we had to hit pause on everything. Um, but the people that we sold uh, the business to, they kept on most of the staff like if they were still in the area they they hired them back and he has gone through and like continued his certification levels and he's he's working for them now like as a diver and that's so it's so cool to me and I feel like a lot of dive shops like need to take an initiative in that you know I I don't know that's that's something that I'm passionate about because I understand that earning level. And I think Mm -hmm. all of us who have worked in the diving industry, especially like we understand that earning level, we don't make very much money. And so where are the opportunities within um, the dive industry itself, right? Or even just a regular person who wants to dive. Totally. Like it doesn't have to be in the professional level, but just Fair. to be to to dive. Um, for instance, it's one thousand on an average. It's gonna be a thousand five hundred pesos to dive, just to do a fun dive, and that's what around thirty dollars. Mm-hmm. And a minimum wage earner in the Philippines is like ten dollars. So you have to be working like double triple just to be able to afford one dive and that's just a dive it doesn't even count the other expenses that you have to incur to be able to enjoy the sport like even for me like i was only able to get my certification because i was a scholar Mm. i actually applied for a scholarship through coral k conservation 10 years ago because of a program they have for filipino scholars um, so they take in Filipinos and then they certify them. And that's the only reason why I started diving in the first place. And otherwise, it would have taken me longer for me to be able to afford or get to where I am. And I know a lot of Filipinos would be interested in diving. It's just that it's too expensive. And I think that's also why there's a growing community of free divers in mm-hmm. the Philippines because it's more affordable. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you shared that organization because that's amazing that that was available for you. 
They, yeah, unfortunately, that... they've left. <laughs> they've oh, left no! The country. Oh. Yeah, but I know a lot of people got certified through them. So mm. so that was very instrumental for a lot of, like, maybe marine biologists or people who are, you know, wanting to learn to scuba dive and have a career in conservation. And they've been very, very helpful. So I was kind of sad that they had to go. But, yeah. But oftentimes, a lot of Filipinos will have to rely on scholarships. And right. that's kind of sad because, you know, we have the most beautiful reefs in, in the world. And yet, we, we don't get to dive it. Right. A lot of Filipinos mm-hmm. don't have access to it. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how many islands do you, do you know 7, offhand 000, the number? 7,641. 7, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. Beautiful. I'm impressed. <laughs> I, that's I can come up with 7,000, but not the rest of it. So <laughs> that's awesome. And I think, I think you're right. That, you know, that, that this is an important point is the, your backyard, Filipinos mm-hmm. backyard, your, your national treasure when it comes to um, the water is, is incredible. Yeah. And yet the barrier to you and others enjoying that is, is the cost and and the, I would say some of the maybe just neglect of understanding the local market in that way and uh, so I think it's really important on two ends one is to understand how diving becomes more localized mm-hmm. how it becomes something that that yeah absolutely Filipinos that are interested Indonesians that are interested Malaysians that are interested right um, that that want to see that for themselves have access to that in some way. Yeah. And I think that that's something that the industry can look at. The other side of that that I wanted to point out is, is also for us individually that are possibly traveling from Europe or, or from the U.S. is to be aware of, of the environment that you're entering into. You know, uh, we did an episode last season on ecotourism. Yeah. And the fifth point around ecotourism, that's, that's kind of a globally accepted view of ecotourism is is awareness um for the culture and the traditions and the people that you are are traveling to and that's regardless of diving or any sort of travel that you're doing and i think that's something that you know if you're listening to this and you go well whatever jay you know like i i what what, how am i going to solve this and that's how i often feel when i hear some of these global systemic issues I think one of the things that you can take away from this, or one of the things I'm taking away from what you're sharing, Ara, is you know, that, that I can be better informed and better aware when I am taking a dive trip and look for opportunities to engage in, in that culture, um, to engage in a way that, that provides possibly you know, opportunity, but more importantly, understanding and empathy for, for those situations. And, and that's how I think we can get better. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And it's an interesting perspective that the very thing that people are traveling to see in the Philippines and, and enter whatever country you want to in into that that is struggling, you know, from a financial or economy standpoint. Um the very people that live there that are a part of that culture don't have access to what we have access to when we travel. And I think that's a really important point to make. So um I'd love to kind of dive into the other side of your business. Um, you know, Diver Bliss, it's like such a prominent online community and it's so beautiful. Like the the way that you've um interacted with your community and created content. Uh, I would I would love to hear if race and things because we all know that the internet can be a giant dumpster fire of yeah. like horrible <laughs> like the worst keyboard warriors yeah. like the worst things <clears throat> in the planet can come out on the internet um so i would love to hear your experience if if there is any like hopefully there's not and you've had a lovely time on the internet but um I, i'd love to <laughs> i'd love to hear about that uh-huh. A lovely Personal time on the internet. Interactions with regards to race, I have had negative interactions in that. Oh, I'm so glad. Like, everybody's been very nice, polite. They've never like insulted me online because I'm Filipino. If anything, I think it has worked to my advantage that I'm Filipino, 
because there aren't a lot of content creators in scuba diving that are Filipinos. Right. And if they do post, it's going to be like not consistent. So mm-hmm. I'm very active online in that sense. And um, people go to me or message me asking for help or advice on where to go. And everyone's been lovely in that sense. So being Filipino or a Filipina diver has actually worked well for me in 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 that in that sense i am so um, glad to and, hear that <laughs> but with regards to other things like you know there's gonna be all the rude comments about other things about you know like how maybe i'm a bad diver or i'm doing things strong the usual things that you also get on your content there's always gonna be those trolls and haters but with regards to me being filipina there's not been a negative interaction online I'm really glad to hear that, like truly, because I have seen other people of um, different backgrounds Mm -hmm. receive some of that. And um, I hate to see it. Like I want to burn those profiles to the ground because I think it's just disgusting that you would say something like that. Um, So I'm I'm just I'm truly, truly pleased that you haven't had that experience. And yes, I Me understand <laughs> the the other side, like you always get negative whatever from yeah. people because that's just what happens, especially at your level. I mean, what do you have like twenty thousand followers now, right? Something like um, that? Yeah, mixed with Instagram and Facebook. And Facebook. I mean, it's it's incredible. So of course you're opening yourself up to um yeah. opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can I can add a two cents here too because I think um, when it comes to not the, having a lovely time on the internet, <laughs> I love that <laughs> phrase. I want a I want a shirt that says I'm having a lovely time on the internet. You know, uh, I just like think a that's big great. thumbs up. You know, the big <laughs> thumbs up. Yeah, or rainbows and unicorns. You know, yeah. uh, with X's in their eyes. But because um, who, whoever has a lovely time on the internet, right? Um, but I think I think there's there's kind of the the category of blatant racism or blatant attacks that, mm. that Sarah, I think, uh, you know, you, you're addressing in some ways for sure that ha- they can happen on the internet or on a dive right. boat or at a dive site or in a dive shop, all that. There's this other category that I think exists and I will speak for myself. At least this is where I, I see it show up a mm-hmm. lot more is this kind of, uh, category that, that Harvard, came out with an article years ago defining as, as casual racism. Mm-hmm. And the way that they talk about that is it's kind of the, the jokes, the statements, the small interactions, things that are, are kind of normalized, kind of, you know, uh, commonplace that have this racial under, undertone to them or, or a, a racial uh, root to the way that they're said. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, think, you know, oh yeah, you know, there's an Asian driving a car in the States, something I get all the time. Right. And, um, you know, that, that's a kind of a commonplace, funny stereotype thing that, that really, I don't think is meant as harmful when it's said, but can, can do damage and, and can reinforce those stereotypes. I'll give an example from diving. I mean, you know, (laughs) this is terrible, but for all, all you dry suit divers out there, um, if you're a male dry suit diver and you need to use the restroom in the middle of a, uh, of a dive, you wear, um, you have a P valve in your suit. And in order to make that work, you wear what's called a condom catheter. So it's a condom catheter. And I have a funny story about learning all about those, but I'll tell much later. But the joke that's funny for a lot of my dive buddies or at a dive site or at a dive boat, when those things start to come out, because everyone knows what you're doing is, uh, you know, oh, you need the extra small. You know what they say about those Asians. And it's f- meant in good jest. It's not meant as like, I hate you. Get off of my boat. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I can't stand you. It's meant as, I think, a way to, to poke fun at me and, and build maybe a rapport. But it's casual racism. Yeah. And I was completely unaware of it before. Yeah. And now I'm aware of it. And the question I have, you know, and I still haven't figured this out. Um, how do you respond? And I just kind of, at this point, laugh it off those kinds of comments, yeah. you know, like, Oh, where are you originally from? Oh, blah, 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 you know, 
you know, have some rice with that. Like, you know, these sorts of just casual joking, yeah. just statements. I just, at this point, the only thing I really can do is like laugh it off. I mm. found myself before being defensive of like trying to go, you know, well, you're German. So, you know what they say about those bratwurst. And then I realized I'm just doing the same thing back because I, yeah. you know, I, I don't know what to do. So I think that's another issue and, and it comes across in different ways, but I'm curious, Ara, you know, for you, not just on the internet, but certainly it can exist there because I'm having a lovely time on the internet, but, uh, you know, at the dive sites and things like that, that those kinds of comments and things coming out, you know, how do you respond to them or have you had experience having to respond to those things? Um, I think what I do get sometimes is like, because I do like engagement posts in on Facebook and I do get weird comments on Facebook about race. Sometimes they'll leave a comment like, oh, I don't want to be diving with Chinese divers. Mm. So, yeah, because of Stop. a certain stereotype because mm. of how supposedly bad they are in diving. So sometimes I'll call them out and say, hey, that's, that's not cool. Like, you shouldn't be, you know, yeah. talking like that. So I'll call them out publicly when they do, they do say stuff like that. And I'll just leave it there for people to see that, you know, that's how you behave <laughs> online. Yeah. And, and that's just not cool. <laughs> so I think calling them out. Um, personally, I've also had the same comment, like person to person. So I just like, uh, not like you try to correct them and say, not everyone's like that. You know, every race probably has their own set of bad divers. And it's mm -hmm. not based on race. Yeah. So you just call them out, I guess. And I know I've been guilty of the same stereotype and, you know, um, profiling when it comes to divers and diving. And you just have to be more conscious and aware of these comments that you end up saying or hearing from the community. You say something really, really important there, which it reminds me back in the day. So I don't know if you remember this. But there was a Broadway play that came out called Avenue Q. Um, and it was a parody on Sesame Street, uh, which is, um, if you don't know Sesame Street, it's, you know, Big Bird and Ernie and Bert and I all that. But it was a Street. whole parody. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Not, not you, are. I'm just saying for the listeners out there, yeah. if you don't know what Sesame Street is, not you, Ara. Um, <laughs> see, there I was, casual racism, Ara read it as, and I was not you meaning it that way. In the Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ara took her shot. I took my shot at Sarah. I think all that's left is Sarah to take a shot at one of us. Uh, oh, that's not happening. So... <laughs> I'm not playing that game. <laughs> but uh, so Avenue Q came out, and it was like I said, a parody on Sesame Street that dealt with a lot of very sensitive cultural issues, at least in the states, um, and you know, with puppets, which is why it was brilliant in a lot of ways. It was puppets dealing with these really culturally sensitive tip topics. And they had a song in there and, and maybe we'll post it up on the, I don't know how, how this is going to go, but the, the song was entitled, everybody's a little bit racist. I'm a little racist too. I remember that. Yeah. That was kind of the lyric. And, and I think that what they were, what, at least for me, what that addressed was that, that the absence of racism is not being colorblind. Right. Is not being, you know, a, no, everyone's the same and I'm just not going to acknowledge. That's not the absence of racism. The, the absence of racism is the use of that, the, 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 the casual racism, systemic racism, cultural racism that comes out either being weaponized and used systemically or culturally or in some way against someone because of their race or being completely unaware, like you say, Ara, that, that I am reinforcing a stereotype or that I'm being racially insensitive. And I think that that's maybe the, the awareness piece because absolutely we, we should celebrate our differences. We should see those differences. We should acknowledge each other's cultures and each other's backgrounds. But we should do that in a way that we're aware of how a comment like, you know what they say about Asians when it comes to condom catheters, is, 
you're aware that that's culturally insensitive, that that is casual racism and that's coming across that way versus, hey, tell me about you, where you're from. I'm genuinely interested because you're, you don't look like me. I get that all the time. It's actually my favorite game to play internationally is where, where is Jay from? Because no one can guess. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that you're Filipino, actually. Yeah, see? yeah. <laughs> well, I got to take off my hat and then you, and you, you'd get it because, uh, you know, it's funny. Most everybody in the world thinks I'm from where they're from. Yeah. You know, I've gotten German, Japanese. I've gotten Dutch, which was a total what? Um, I've gotten Malaysian and everything else. The, the ones that know are the, the Filipino grandmothers. Uh, well, I'll, I'll Filipino. Of course. Like, yeah, every time. It's not even like, where are you from? What do you mean? They're, they're just like, yep, yeah, I know where the you're from. The grandmas always time. know. The grandmas yeah. always know. Every, like, hands down. Um, I would like to say something just on that bit that you started to talk about, and this might up upset some people, right? But we're talking about the systemic part of things. and And that's... You know, we saw a lot of this, at least in the United States in 2020 with Black Lives Matter. Right. Obviously, that was a that's a movement that's been around for a long time because we've had a ton of issues with racism in the United States. And that whole colorblind thing is something that drives me crazy because people that look like me are all like, well, don't all lives matter? And it's like people miss the point with that conversation the reason why they say Black Lives Matter is because they haven't mattered in the past. Uh -huh. They haven't been a part, like they haven't been yeah. treated on the level of people that look like me. And that's why we we've, we've centered them. We say Black Lives Matter because there are still so many people in this country specifically that don't think that they do and that are treated like people treat them very, very differently. They're targeted you know, by police, the police brutality is through the, the, you know, stratosphere with that community. And it's something that obviously we don't, we don't see so much because we're, we're doing a recreational sport. Right. But at the same time, do we see any black people in our materials? Right. Do yeah. we see like, it's, we're not, we're not seeing them so much. I'm starting to see them on social media and it's making yeah. me so happy, yeah. like so, so happy. And I think that's where like as a white person, you know, you talk about like, how do you respond? How I respond as an, I hope that I act as an ally in this conversation, but I don't laugh. I don't laugh at that stuff because the second that, I give that person who's making a racially insensitive joke uh, the satisfaction mm -hmm. of getting a, a like sought out reaction, right? They're hoping to get laughter. And yeah. so if they get laughter from me, then that's encouraging them that this is okay, right? Yeah. So whether or not I like, I may not say something in the moment of like, hey, that's not okay. Like if I don't want to call them out in front of a group, like maybe I'll step aside with them and have a conversation with them later, but I will not laugh. And I will make it clear that like, not funny, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I think that's something that people that look like me, other white people, we can um, be better allies in that sense and not continue this um, use of stereotypes and things. I mean, yes, it, like you said, with the Avenue Q, like, uh, what, what was it? Everyone's or, a little racist. I'm a little racist too. That one. Yeah. Everyone's a little racist. I'm a little <clears throat> racist too. Like it's, it's something that is there, right? It's in the room with us. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's how I want to respond in that way and how I, I want to encourage a environment where that's not, like the norm well said well said. i don't know yeah you probably you know and to reinforce what you're saying sarah i think that that again to localize this down to the person because it, it's overwhelming sometimes when you think about the systemic nature of some of these things and you you trace yeah. back all the way to you know slavery and emancipation and 
and you know the loophole that that existed out of you know the emancipation proclamation was um you know unless someone was a criminal if they were a convicted criminal then they could still be enslaved and it's fascinating to look at that history and say well then that's when you start to see the the black criminal because it was a way to hanging on to that labor and and how that's carried through all the way to today and again i i cannot speak on on that with authority in the sense that my own journey has been so convoluted and i still haven't made sense of it in a way but i think to localize things from a systemic level down to a personal level is is one i think to inform yourself like you talk about sarah why what does it mean black lives matter not just the the response of all lives matter oh of course like that's such a cheeky uh, to me uneducated response mm-hmm. um we can educate ourselves if i'm going to travel to see you are i'm going to educate myself i'm going to educate myself on what's happening in in your world and i'm going to ask you to educate me how can i be better better aware of what's happening i mean taking trips down to mexico that was one of the first questions that i asked mm-hmm. and and i learned a lot about for example the the train Maya or Maya train I can, I can never remember which word comes first but you know the train that was going to go over the uh, <laughs> I know Sarah's laughing at me I'm being culturally insensitive to language here but no you got it it's just yeah. you know Spanish versus English so I know it's always yeah. messing with my brain but <laughs> the uh, I learned about that and how it's not just about diving and and it's about the cultural roots of the of the Mayan people that have been there for centuries and centuries you can be informed as a as a traveler you can be informed about people that are coming to dive with you that don't look like you that are part of your dive club or part of your dive meetup on tuesday nights or whatever it would be and then i think the other side to localize this a little bit more is as sarah said is is to be an ally and sometimes that's a quiet ally like you said sarah i'm not going to laugh i'm going to make sure that that i'm not reinforcing that and and i also think the other side of it is is maybe in a quiet moment to acknowledge I saw what happened, yeah. you know, and I'm, or, or whatever. That's always, we're going to get into this with gender and, and uh, sexism and everything else later, yeah. Sarah, because, uh, you know, these are the things that I think about, but I think localizing the, those things down is how we as an industry and as a community of, of divers worldwide can really make an impact and evolve forward. And I would even argue you know, potentially be a leader for adventure support sports worldwide, because at the end of the day, the, the, under the water, we all speak the same language under the water. We all are, are, are the same human beings, right? It, it, I mean, you're behind a mask and, you know, maybe a wetsuit or a dry suit and a tank. And, you know, we're, we're all, you know, water doesn't is the great equalizer. And, the stuff that happens before that is the systemic and blatant and casual racism that either prevents people from being under that water or makes people feel uncomfortable for being a part of that. And that's an area that I think we can, we can definitely do personally to maybe make some sense of, of this conversation in some ways. What, I don't know. What do you think, Ara? Is that am I far reaching here or, or what's, your, what's your experience there? Um, well, to localize it, I think... Because we're a very, as you know, our history is filled with colonizers. Mm -hmm. And I think systemically, that's also why it is how we are profiled or stereotyped in our own country. It's because we're like sometimes treated as second class citizens or, you Mm -hmm. know, treated poorly and that foreigners are better than us. And it's ingrained in our culture. And unfortunately, you still see that in diving and in you know how um for a lot of foreigners run shops and they don't treat the locals or their their staff well they you know i've heard stories wherein like a dive master was um the owner said to the dive master that he was earning too much for a filipino and i was like what and 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 it's like you're doing business in our country. You're running a shop, and that's how yeah. you treat 
the locals. That's kind of horrible, you know? And and people will just like not do anything. What can I do? They're they're the ones feeding me. They're the ones giving me money for me to survive and to live and to provide for my family. I can't report it to anyone. What's what what will you know? And at the end of the day, Filipinos will just take it and and not do anything and accept that kind of treatment because what choice do they have? So it's like I think it's very important that you also like when you go to a place find out how they treat their employees, how they treat their staff. Yeah. Like do they employ well, pay well and give benefits to these people mm-hmm. and if they don't, maybe you shouldn't be supporting these businesses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is yeah. such a good point. Oh my gosh. Like it can I can only imagine how predatory it like the relationship can be yeah. in that situation. Yeah. Ugh. And I would say that that's true of period. You're talking about liveaboards, you're talking about yeah. where you go get training, you're talking about dive boat operations, you're talking about all of the and, and I think that would even go farther when you were talking about our, you know, the the dive shop slash restaurant slash bar right slash hostel slash you know uh, everything else that 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 certainly happens um, at least I've said that you know how how they treat their employees and and sometimes that's a little hard to figure out before yeah, you're on a definitely. trip but if you see it and you're aware of it going back or not saying something I think is just as bad so yeah. um, I think it's a really important thing that that where we choose if you're a tourist out there and you're planning dive travels um to these destinations how you spend your money has something to say about this entire topic and being more again mindful and aware of those decisions i think can have a huge impact and and i would i would even say that this maybe our extends beyond just how we spend our money when when traveling but what gear we buy hmm. right where is that manufactured there's been a huge movement around the the textiles industry in the sourcing of where things are manufactured the philippines being one of the big manufacturers and and having fair trade how how is that happening in in the way that i buy a, a wing or a bcd or a regulator um how are are those uh, equipment companies that are now a lot of them owned by multi conglomerate uh you know investment groups what are their practices can i ask can i understand and i think that again when you talk about how we spend our time and how we spend our resources and doing that in a mindful way doing that in an informed way mm-hmm. i think has a lot to say about where this industry goes so i appreciate you sharing that that a lot because i think it's a good an, a good personalized localized view of of this this uh, this issue yeah i i would say um it's also a good piece of advice for people listening and for people traveling that if you see things happening that are not okay right you see locals not being treated well at the dive shop like speaking up and and talking to the operator if that doesn't go well you know social um social clout is a thing like leaving a review and and not being um you know being very clear about it like maybe i i had a great time diving with them but i saw them treating the locals really poorly so i don't recommend um you know i don't recommend booking with these people um i think that is a really good way to start to weed out some of the people that um aren't doing business well yeah so well, good yeah well all right <laughs> um i i have to say i i really want to come out and and dive together at some yeah, point should. and i'm so impressed with uh with diver bliss and and we uh i wish you just the best with all the trips that you're ho- hopefully i can I can bring a crew or at least myself and uh, yeah. or we do a dive table crew out there 
and spend time with you um, because I've never been to the Philippines and yet my grandmother was from Luzon. So uh, <laughs> craziness, but we got to change that. You yeah, got to get we out do. there. You we got to change it. It has to happen. But I, I just want to say, you know, from, from the bottom of, of my heart um, and I, and I maybe Sarah, I'll speak um, for us as the dive table, not just for, for me is we just really appreciate you uh, coming on the show, sharing your insights um, and and having an open dialogue about this. And mm-hmm. I think that openness and, um, and willingness to tell your story is, is admirable. And if they're, you know, if you're listening out there, uh, I really encourage you to go to diverbliss.com and, uh, you know, check out all of Ara's amazing content. But more than that, send her a message and say hello. Introduce yourself. Yes. Have a, have a conversation. <laughs> um, even if you never intend to dive with her, say hello. That connection matters. And but so you should. I just want to say thanks. Yeah, you should. You should, you should. You should. You should go diving. Absolutely. No, Come join I, me in the Philippines. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, I'd, love, I'd love to give you the floor to promote anything that you have going on, your trips. Like, just put it all out there. Let people know besides your website that Jay's already yeah. mentioned. Like, plug yourself. Go. <laughs> yeah. So do follow me at Diver Bliss. That's on Instagram, Facebook. My website is DiverBliss.com. Um, you can find the list of my trips there or you can message me anytime. If you have questions about diving in the Philippines, I'd be happy to answer or help you out, plan your trip. Or you can join one of my trips. I've got several trips this year. I have around, I think, four lined up. Yeah. Yeah, July, August, September, and November. So That's right. do. That's amazing. Say hello. And let's talk about diving. Cool. Thank you so much. It was great Thank talking you. to you. Great talking to you. And uh, like I said, consider us allies and fans. And uh, and hopefully I'll get out there. Gosh, the one in, uh, in um, how do you pronounce Sarangani? Sarangani. Is that correct? Yes. Sarangani Bay. Wow. Yeah. In September. That looks, uh, <laughs> looks pretty amazing. <laughs> I'm tempted. I don't know. People go there. Well, I know that's that's part there. of it. Yeah, yep. it looks pretty amazing to I me. I try to so. focus on like places where not a lot of people go. Very smart. So, yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you so we'll, much. We'll hear. We'll be back with another episode of the Dive Table. <laughs>